really great park options in the uh, uh, chat. So thank you all for being here. Um, very exciting to have all of you here. And um, clearly uh, this topic has really resonated uh, with folks. So um, I'm gonna give one more minute and then we'll get started. All right, I'm going to get going. Um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Rebecca Bear. I am the CEO of the Seattle Parks Foundation and uh, super excited to have you all here on our very first um, uh, series of a series of events uh, called um, Livable and Equitable Cities and Parks. Um, we're super excited to have um, a, a really great topic tonight and um, so glad that you're here with us. Uh, I'm going to introduce a little bit of the Seattle Parks Foundation and go through some logistics and, and then I'm going to hand it off to our great panel of speakers and um, our board chair. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to uh, let you know a little bit about the Seattle Parks Foundation. Um, we work with over 65 community driven organizations, which together really create a thriving, accessible and connected system of public space for, this, for Seattle and the region. Uh, in the last several years, we have focused on addressing the inequities in our public spaces, particularly in BIPOC and historically marginalized communities. And today you're going to be learning about one of those neighborhoods and how through community advocacy, engagement, and addressing systemic inequities, Rainier Beach is going to be transformed. Uh, super excited about that. A few logistics for the evening. Um, this event is being recorded. Uh, so if you have any concerns, uh, please notify the, uh, the um, uh, moderator, which is Love Parks. Um, we are, and this recording will be available to others afterwards. So please let us know if you'd like a, a recording. Uh, tonight, we have some really great experts uh, to share and chat a little bit more about um, the history of redlining in the city history of discrimination and racism, as well as, um, uh, you know, the activism and great work of the community in order to, to right some of those historical wrongs. Um, tonight, we're gonna have Jennifer Ott from History Link, um, as well, and also um, a Olmsted expert. Um, and we also have Sally Lee and Ashley Towns from the Link to Lake Open Space Steering Committee, um, who are representing uh, Beersheba Park. Um, and we're super excited to have them uh, share their experiences. So a few details and questions um, before I introduce our board chair. You can go ahead and submit your questions um, into the Q&A or in the chat um, and uh, into the Q and submit your questions in the Q&A and then in the chat. We are also gonna be sharing some um, of uh, links and resources uh, that um, throughout the presentation. So if you are, looking for more details and information, um, check in the chat and you should be able to um, uh, find resources there. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Maya. Maya Mendoza Ekstrom is our um, board chair, um, phenomenal board chair, very enthusiastic about this. She's also on the Wing Look board and has been heavily engaged in uh, these issues around equity around the city. So. Um, Maya, take it away. Thank you, Rebecca. And I will echo Becca, Rebecca's welcome to all of you on behalf of the board for the Seattle Parks Foundation. Before we get going tonight, wanted to very quickly, but not, uh, not 
not to overly so, do a, a land acknowledgement, which has become central to how the Seattle Parks Foundation operates and of particular import to the conversations that we will have this evening. First, tonight, we want to, want to begin by acknowledging that we are on Indigenous land, the traditional territories of the Duwamish and the Coast Salish people, who since time immemorial have taken care of, hunted, fished, gathered, and buried their ancestors on these lands. We respect their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, and we honor their sacred spiritual connection with the land and the water. And in the chat, as Rebecca mentioned, um, our, our staff are gonna drop some links if you are more interested in identifying the native land that, that you are personally situate on, um, as well as links to uh, participate in Pay Real Rent and realrentduwamish.org, as you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, on behalf of the Parks Department, I, or Parks, sorry, Parks Department, Park Foundation wanted to start tonight by, by suggesting to you that the conversation that is going to be had tonight fundamentally is one of success. That said, it is one where we are constantly having um, a dialogue around the burdens of history, the burdens of legacy, the challenges of celebrating the verdant green wonderful public spaces that make Seattle um, a destination for people both, both in uh, our region and, and across the world. And at the same time, coming to an acknowledgement that that is not the way in which public space and parks are experienced by everyone that lives in our community. I think if you, for me personally, as I travel in other parts of the country, I, I think about how far I am away from water that's a very real and pressing and tangible part of being in a place like Colorado for me, being very far away from water, having been born and raised here in the Pacific Northwest and in Seattle. And I think about that opening picture on that slide that has started this presentation and the importance of having access to all of those verdant, amazing natural resources that we as a, as, a, as a society in, in, the, in the region of the of city of Seattle, of, of Puget Sound, take for granted. And that not every single kid that's born into uh, families for the last uh, multiple generations, three, four, five generations, have the same relationship to water that I do. Um, and the challenge of history is not to be burdened by it, but to look at examples like Beersheba, like we'll hear today, and to accelerate the work, to accelerate our understanding of how important it is for every part of our community to be connected to parks and public spaces, to take the Olmstead legacy and modernize it, to, to evolve how we think about investment, and to really honestly and truly and once and for all, get away from the inertia of de deprioritization and racism in how we think about which public spaces get built next. And so with that, I would love, as a history major, would love, and I'm very excited to turn this over to Jennifer Ott. She is an environmental historian and the assistant director of History Link. She's a past president of the Friends of Seattle's Olmstead Parks and currently a member of the Volunteer Park Trust Steering Committee. And she's written articles for History Link on, and the book, Olmstead in Seattle, creating a park system for a modern city. So Jennifer, give us the history. Thank you so much. Uh, let me share my screen here. Oh, oh, it says it'll shop another person. So I'm gonna continue, it should be okay. And can you all see my screen? Thank you. Now I get to my notes. All right. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be part of this project um, or this panel discussion tonight. Um, working on the Olmstead book, uh, there was so much to think about to tell that story. And um, I started with my own preconceptions and I, I learned a tremendous amount as I did my research. But I will say I, I, I am, have the urge to preface this by saying that I am still learning. 
And this is a 10 minute overview, which is sort of the swashbuckling careening version of this story. And there's so much to explore. It's a very complicated story. So I look forward to your questions and um, always feel free to contact me via history link if you would like to know more. But I hope to give kind of a nice foundation for our conversation tonight and um, to support the work of the Link to Lake uh, group. So um, this is a map here of our, the Olmstead Park system, the 1908 plan. And I'll be talking about how the story of this park system helps us understand the story of Beersheba Park. So to understand that story, we have to go all the way back to the 1900s. And this is a PI article from 1902. And we see the influence here of the City Beautiful Movement, which is the earliest urban planning in the United States. And we also see the influence of Frederick Law Olmsted because in this article, they talk about how they want to use the development of a park system to make the city beautiful. And there is um, the public park system idea, not just parks, but a park system that he promoted. And um, all of that is encapsulated in one article from 1902 because Seattle civic leaders saw the city growing exponentially after the uh, Klondike Gold Rush started in 1897. And so they had a real fear that they would not be able to develop a park system because the city would grow too quickly and uh, the, the chance would pass them by. And we see this um, effort kind of, or this um, ethos that was crossing the United States all the way from the East Coast, which Seattleites then especially, but now even still, We'll sort of look to the East Coast for what is the um, legitimate uh, big idea about urban planning. And so Olmsted's work at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893 really kicks off this idea of city beautiful, that beautiful spaces help create um, livable cities and livable cities make for a better electorate, those people who are voting in a democracy. Olmsted, of course, is also known for Central Park, the design that he did with Calvert Box, who was his business partner. And then they're also known for the Buffalo Park System, the first public park system in the United States. And that was developed um, there and by Olmsted and Vox. And their goal there is that to have these park system is to provide access for everyone. And I love this quote because it really captures, particularly at that time, the disparity of opportunity. If you can't afford to go to the mountains and to, the, um, to nature in order to restore yourself um, and from the incredible bustle of these industrial American cities that have very little organization or beauty at that time. And um, he, if you want to make sure people have that opportunity, which is important for having healthy hearts, minds, and bodies, uh, Olmsted recognized, then um, you need to provide public space. And he was focused on the democracy and the voters, which of course would have been white men at that time in the 1850s when they're first developing these ideas. But he understands it as essential for a livable city. And that idea would be pulled forward and um, throughout the, his writings and his son's writings, you'll see references to access for everyone. And so Frederick Law Olmsted retired before city uh, Seattle was ready to develop a park system. And so the Olmsted that came to Seattle was John Olmsted and he was the Olmsted of the Olmsted brothers firm. He and his half brother, Rick Olmsted uh, formed that firm. And um, after the elder Olmsted retired, and that was the Olmsted that came to Seattle. And in addition to that ethos of parks for all, he brought these design principles. And the key one I want to talk about tonight um, is the genius of place. And this postcard is a shot of the Court of Honor looking down and from the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition, which was held at the University of Washington campus in 1909. And you see in the distance, the foothills in Mount Rainier. And the genius of place is this idea that you design a landscape in order to capture that place that is most 
the most significant natural element of that place. And here it's the view of Mount Rainier, which you can see throughout the city, but there's nothing quite like this particular view, which is still um, available today. The university has protected it very carefully. And so when Olmsted came in 1903, he developed this comprehensive plan that captured hilltop city uh, parks and uh, shoreline parks and places along bluffs, and then also small neighborhood parks, and then the parkways that connected those large parks. And so the idea is that you have a diversity of landscapes. Uh, you have a zoo, you have an arboretum, you have old growth forest, you have a very designed park and volunteer park. And so um, you also get um, the opportunity for everyone to have um, access to designed outdoor space. And all of the spaces were designed, even if they did not seem like it. I and mean, even Seward Park is a designed landscape. And the goal was to have a park within a half mile of every home and a play field for grammar school aged kids within a mile of every home. In the 1900s, the city of Seattle, after Olmsted's 1903 plan, they annexed a number of areas. And so the Olmsted came back in 1908 to develop um, a supplemental plan, which extended the uh, park system throughout the city and the newly annexed areas. And you'll see in the lower right there is that Seward Park sticking out like a little finger. And um, the area that we're talking about tonight is incorporated into this plan. And then in 1910, uh, they had him come back again and do a playgrounds planned, which put uh, play fields throughout the city. Those, the ones that had the field houses, not just um, like school playgrounds, these are play fields for older kids. And um, you'll notice here, I just, I always love to include this picture because it was a very different understanding of playground equipment at, in that era. This is terrifying as a parent, but very commonplace then. So we have these three plans. They establish a park system throughout the city. And this is a map from 1909. And um, this is essentially the parts that were realized while Olmsted was actively working in Seattle. And um, there were other parts that were added later, but this gives you a good sense of what they were able to achieve. The Board of Park Commissioners primarily were doing the guiding of this work what was able to be achieved under the direct guidance of Olmsted. And so did we achieve park access for everyone? Yes and no. There is a remarkable uh, string or arc of parks that are available throughout the city. Um, those large landscapes in the really uh, significant landscape areas were protected. We have the boulevard around Green Lake, we have Woodland Park, Washington Park, Lake Washington Boulevard. Um, Seward Park would soon join the park system, Jefferson Park. And so um, you do see that there is a fairly even distribution around the city, but the closer, um, but you'll notice that the boulevards in the uh, Duwamish River Valley, West Seattle and Southeast Seattle, and also in Ballard did not get fully developed. The dotted lines give a sense of the ones that were not developed. So that's up here in this area and this area here, they, those they were still hoping to develop. And so um, the thing that you see though, is you'll recognize really quickly that that string of parks and boulevards that extends from Volunteer Park down through Interlochen and from the university campus through Washington Park, then down along the lake are the most developed. That is the most cohesive and coherent part of the park system plan that got developed. And those are, as we know, the wider and wealthier parts of the city. And so the parks and parkways were placed there because of the genius of place. Those really capture the most spectacular views and landscapes. And those would have been the most expensive um, neighborhoods in Seattle anyway. But that doesn't mean that they would have necessarily have been predominantly white as has been true throughout their history. Less so now, but still a, that is recognized as a predominantly white neighborhood. And so the things that have led to that racial differentiation are systemic issues. The systemic reason that we are all grappling, grappling with today. Um, we have housing discrimination that lasts, that is legal until the late 1960s. We have education and employment discrimination that kept people of color at lower incomes. 
And then we have redlining, which reduced the ability of BIPOC families to accumulate generational wealth. So all of those things keep people away from the um, neighborhoods that have those really spectacular and what people often associate with the most Olmstedian landscapes. In addition to the, um, those systemic issues, we also have that the closer a property is to a park and boulevard or park or boulevard, then you get higher property values. And so it's sort of all of those things that are keeping BIPOC families incomes down are also making it harder for them to um, access land and purchase land closer to those um, parks and parkways. Also, we have a zoning issue. Um, zoning, uh, Olmsted was here before the city instituted official zoning policies, but he always recommended single family houses with generous lot sizes adjacent to the parkways and parks. And that was so there was a um, context for the park that sort of carried that park experience outside of the boundaries of the publicly owned land. And so his intent um, was to create the or continue the landscape and experience. But the secondary effect was that that raises the property value and the cost of living there, which then leaves people out. Um, so then um, what about other neighborhoods? Um, how did they fare in Olmsted Park system development? And it's an interesting thing to think about because while there are not these iconic Olmstedian landscapes like Lake Washington Boulevard, there are some pretty great landscapes. There is Rainier Playfield, uh, Schmitz Park, uh, let's see, Delridge Playfield. Um, one of my favorite places to drive is to go um, across Henderson, up Carkeek Drive to Beacon Avenue and follow that boulevard along the ridge line and enjoy the views to the east and west. Um, Ballard Playfield, um, that's my neighborhood up here in Ballard. Those are all Olmsted, but they're not as well developed according to Olmsted's vision. And um, Beacon Avenue is not entirely owned by the park department. And so there's a little bit of difficulty with keeping it maintained as a park landscape. And so you have fairly even distribution, but not equal development. And um, it is a complicated story to explain why there is not that even development. But for our discussion tonight, the important thing to understand is that that correlation between the more developed that a property is and the less, um, the higher the property value that's associated with it is um, becomes very important over time. And this is a map created in 1936 by the Homeowners Loan Corporation. And it is, if you look at the legend in the lower left corner, it shows the um, ethnic communities that are living in these neighborhoods and the arrows show the ways that those neighborhoods are growing. And um, it is unabashedly racist and um, it correlates with this map, which is the red lining map. I'm guessing a lot of people here are familiar with this story, that those red areas are the places that were considered the highest risk. And so the, less like, the least likely to be invested in. And not all, but many of them have a racial component to that judgment. And so it does not matter what the houses are like. It matters who lives in those houses that affected their rating which then had the ripple effect of affecting investment and affecting loan availability and all of those things that only exacerbate that relationship between um, the, the income and race of people that are living close to Seattle's parks. And so you'll notice also that the area to the south, this yellow area is um, all yellow, and that is the next highest risk area. So it goes red is the highest risk and then yellow is the next highest risk. And so um, this is an area that at this time in the 1930s is predominantly white. But what you see is that as housing discrimination just dis decreased, illegal ho housing discrimination decreased in the 1970s and 1980s and more right, by white residents moved to the suburbs, BIPOC communities moved southward. And so at that point, it became more important to develop open spaces that would bring park benefits to those communities that needed them most. 
that have the least opportunity to get out of the city to vacation in places of natural beauty. And um, think of that 1858 quote that I showed you earlier. And that didn't happen. Significant efforts were made to acquire land, but maintenance of the non-utilitarian elements of parks has been lacking. Um, there is also the issue that so much of the park department's projects rely on community involvement. And that usually means that people raise money for the parks near them, which reinforces those disparities. It's one thing to raise $50,000 in one neighborhood that is wealthier, and it's a whole different thing to raise $50,000 in a neighborhood that has lower incomes. And so that model is um, challenging. And I always compare it to, we don't ask people to raise money for their streets. And a park is essential, as essential as a street. So why are we expecting neighborhoods to do this sort of thing? A little editorializing there. So um, I will almost done here. I know I'm running a little long. Um, these are two pictures of Beersheba Park when it was known as Atlantic City Park. One is from the lake um, looking inward and one is from about where the boat ramp is looking northward and you can see that dock and then Pritchard Island in the distance. And um, there's one more piece of this story that's really important and that is that changes in priorities and vegetation management has led to the decline of many elements that capture the genius of place in Seattle parks. It is really hard to maintain view corridors and shoreline access all in all these different ways in this incredibly large park system. And so you see how that has affected Beersheba Park. And it's interesting to note how the boat ramp to the south has been maintained and upgraded and is fully functional and that gets it ever since the post-war era, that emphasis on facilities, recreation, um, utilitarian elements of parks has been far, um, has received far more emphasis than sort of the softer uh, assets, which are the, the things like this adorable bridge here, or sorry, this adorable dock here. And so, um, I'll end with focusing right in on the neighborhood where we are. You'll see that all of these elements here that are marked are L. Olmsted parks. They're from those park system plans. That dashed um, line, the light green one, is where the original uh, parkways were supposed to go. But you'll see that there are a lot of opportunities. But Beresheva Park, and this is the view that from the shoreline here on the right, is this amazing place. Of it captures that genius of place that offers a view across the lake to the foothills and Mount Rainier in ways that you can't get anywhere else. This is very specific to this place. And so um, I am so grateful and excited to the Link to Lake people that they are doing the work to bring back that design and tending and care to this particular place in the city and will help sort of restore that Olmstead vision for this place in a way that will be really meaningful to the neighborhood. So I will pass it back to Maya and I apologize for going long. I practiced so hard to go short, but there we go. Thank you, Jennifer. That was fascinating. I wrote down so many notes and I think it's a perfect frame and we will transition very quickly to Ashley and Sally. Um, Sally, no, no offense to you as a fellow lawyer, but I'm pretty sure Ashley is smarter than both of us combined when, when I read her, her bio here. Um, the testament to sort of those problematic policies and the resilience of community is really something we can see in Beersheba. And I, I appreciate Jennifer for framing all of those layers of intersectionality. Um, and and Beersheba, the Beersheba Lake Access Project has been a long-term partner uh, with the Seattle Parks Foundation. And we're, and we're really excited to share it as a success with all of you tonight. Sally Lee and Ashley Towns from Link to Lake Open Space Steering Committee are here to really tell us more about the work that they have done to restore this ignored and underfunded outdoor resource that is obviously spectacularly beautiful. They're both sort of connected to the city in different ways. Born and raised in South Seattle, Sally Lee is the co-chair of Link to Lake Open Space Steering Committee and she's a passionate volunteer for all things Rainier Beach. She's a real estate broker and an attorney. So shout out there, props, props for that. Um, and then the smartest person in the room tonight is Ashley Towns. She's a fisheries ecologist, educator, international infield environmental researcher and environmental justice advocate. 
She's currently pursuing her PhD in quantitative fisheries ecology. I'm going to have to look that up at the University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. And she also implements community based environmental projects and programs in the US and abroad to organizations and institutions. Ashley continue, continues to research, explore, and carry out best cross-cultural practices in natural resource management, especially as related to Black and Indigenous populations, people of color, and ethnic minority groups. I'm getting out of the way, you two. It is all yours. Thank you so much, Maya, for the lovely, lovely introduction. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. Yes, thank you, Maya. I guess I'll start us off. Um, I'm the Sally half of the show. Um, <laughs> Ashley, jump in, in a little bit. And so I'm super excited to bring this amazing park improvement project to you all. This project is truly by and for the Rainier Beach community. I've personally been involved since late 2016. It's it's truly amazing project. So you may be wondering where this park is located. Um, we are in Rainier Beach at the intersection of Henderson and Seward Park Avenue. And the park is nestled in between the Rainier Beach Urban Farm and the Atlantic City Boat Ramp. And the park is within walking distance to several schools. Actually, Rainier Beach High School is just across the street. And our awesome community center happens to be the most visited uh, community center in all of Seattle and just right down the street from this park. We are an incredibly diverse neighborhood with a BIPOC majority, and most households speak a language other than English at home. And at least 19 different languages are spoken between our 5,000 residents. So as Sally just explained, Rainier Beach is incredibly, incredibly diverse. It's a melting pot of cultures. And we are so fortunate to be geographically positioned uh, next to the Southern end of Lake Washington. The reason I say we are fortunate is because there's much evidence out there that shows that residents of low income and minority communities that have less access than more affluent neighborhoods uh, to parks and other forms of green infrastructure. So this equity map that you see, which was designed by our community's committee's project manager, George Lee, uh, shows that the red stars represent existing signature waterfront parks. And a signature water park, park is defined by a park that has generous amounts of trails, playgrounds, uh, bathrooms, and natural shorelines. And the red lines that you see on the map denote extended shoreline. And as you can see, those big green circles, um, Rainier Beach and the Duwamish River Valley South Park neighborhood has a question mark on there, um, which means that these areas are below standard. These areas do, do not have a waterfront park. And these two communities are considered low income and incredibly multicultural and multiracial, and a high risk of displacement and dramatically lower levels of access to park resources in that are white dominated areas of the city. So the Rainier Beach Lake to Lake Committee is currently addressing these issues with our potential green and blue space. And I define, define green space as an open area with trees and shrubs, among other types of vegetation, and a blue space as the waterfront parks as I just explained in rivers and estuaries, oceans and lakes. And these attributes of green space and blue space, you can probably imagine, have a lot of positive benefits to uh, people and can bring physical activity, well being, um, improve mental health, and social connectedness, connectedness. And our current issue with our undefined park is that, for one, there is a comfort station blocking the ideal of our lake. And a comfort station is essential to any park, but ours makes ours blue space incredibly invisible and is in need of an upgrade. There's also exposed pipes around and sewage overflow, which makes it a non-swimming beach, which is quite unfortunate. And these exposed pipes illuminate the safety issues, right, around the local blue space. And our community has been vocal for a while now about not trusting the water quality um, due to these exposed pipes and unkept shorelines. Um, we're fighting for park furnishings, uh, basic things such as picnic tables and um, lights um, in Bear Shadow Park, basic amenities. And it's been an unnecessary battle, uh, we can say, and uh, with various parties and uh, entities about um, how we protect and maintain these um, environmental spaces and us fighting for places, things like such as a shelter to protect us from different elements, um, environmental elements. There's a, this, this is a major, major inequity. Um, and this is also um, something we've been trying to address for a while. 
Um, we've been competing, unfortunately, with uh, Rainier Beach projects for funding um, is another issue we face. Um, our allies and um, collaborators are also going for small grants that are available that align to our mission in improving the park, which makes it really um, tough when we're trying to fight for the same pot of money um, and trying to, to improve our social climate and going after the same pot of money um, is uh, a, lot, a lot of times um, very difficult. Um, we have this, so uh, for our Lick the Lake Salmon Habitat Restoration Project as an enhancement to the overall Rainier Beach Park Initiative uh, to restore salmon habitat at the southern end of Lake Washington. In 2019, a few Link to Lake members, including um, William Pickard and George Lee and myself submitted a King County grant proposal uh, to improve the shoreline and aquatic landscape of the Bear River Park. And this uh, grant was uh, proposed to decrease in case of plant species and predation um, and install large woody materials and diverse upland riparian vegetation and significantly enhance the amount of optimal shoreline. Um, and that also includes estuary substrates and, and um, really help the habitat of juvenile Chinook salmon that have been coming back since 2016, which is quite exciting. And as you can probably imagine that these enhancements would um, provide refuge and shade for salmon and would lower and stabilize the water temperature that will increase their survival out there and uh, boost production of uh, food resources for the Chinook salmon. And in spring 2020, very exciting news, uh, the group was awarded $15,000 for permitting to rehabilitate and enlarge what remains of the lake, shoreline aquatic habitat, and migration corridor at Bear River Park. And a couple of weeks ago, we were also notified that we were awarded $504,000 for the construction. And Sally would now share with you explicitly about our community's desires and ideas. Thanks, Ashley. So considering the historic wrongs that Jennifer mentioned and the substandard conditions that Ashley just touched upon, our group offers some really practical and actionable solutions to remedies, remedy these. But at first, I think we should recognize that and remind ourselves that equity does not mean equality. That image on the top right um, that you guys probably have seen over the last couple of years uh, shows you that equity requires compensatory actions. It requires an offset. And based on the current conditions of the park, we haven't even received equal treatment. And so one of the solutions the city can do to implement equity is to prioritize and redirect funding to projects and neighborhoods that have been historically underserved. And actually by not doing this, the city is actually advancing the status quo and maintaining the structurally racist ways in which they've operated. And as many as learn, have learned in this last year, systems that may not be prejudicial, classist, or racist on its face may be exactly that in practice. And as we were told by the Parks Department that there was no money for a project due to the pandemic, their golf course line item grew from 11 million in 2019 to 13 million in 2020. And another thing that's actually not up on the slide is another solution um, that we thought about is for the Parks Department to recognize that these equitable opportunities for them to show their commitment will come from the bottom up. They will come from community and there has to be structures or some sort of um, way for them to implement these ideas and these opportunities. And if these just sit on the sideline, they're not doing any service to anybody. And so we'll take a quick step back actually and look at a mini case study of mine at um, of Lake Ridge Playground and what institutionalized power looks like. So Lake Ridge Playground is, a, is located just a few minutes south of our project. And in 2019, Parks initiated a very well-deserving um, improvements to this park. In 2019, at that point, we were about two years into our project. And this is a screen grab on the right of their website. And it shows that in a little more than a year, they designed, funded, and will start construction on this $1.8 million project, which is exactly the amount that we were asking for. And I just wonder to all of you, what do you think this looks like to our community when we walked with parks for almost five years and to see a self-initiated project get pushed through with lightning speed while we've been sitting here asking the state, King County, and private foundations for money for this project. And we've also been put in the very 
uncomfortable position of having to explain why Parks is not funding a project of which they are the property owner. Um, but on the flip side, I'm also optimistic that this quick movement shows that they can flex and move promptly when their priorities are aligned and they want to do so. So how do we get these two things to match, connecting these um, equitable priorities and quick implementation? So that's something I believe that Parks really has to figure out. And um, yeah, an incredible amount of advocacy by your project, but also an obscene amount of fun along the way. <laughs> I'll pass it back off to Ashley and tell you guys more about that. So our outreach ref efforts are incredibly grassroots and it consists of putting together community social events and public meetings where we authentically engage with the community, um, also through social media. And it's truly about meeting the community where they are and being an active listener. And we went to spaces used by the community and went there on weekends in order to effectively uh, connect local residents. And our attention was to not only build a relationship, but also collect and integrate the community's input into the design of our projects to increase uh, diversity, inclusivity, and belongingness. And number one, build trust among the community. Uh, we wanted to show that we value them and that we value their ideas and perspectives and want to hear all of the concerns that they may have. So during year one, we really focused on our outreach efforts at community centers, like the Somali Community Center. And in year two, we had social engagements and events at the Rainier Beach Community Center. In year three, we had a uh, awesome beer, bear shell of beach party and a grilled off and had food and walking tours of the project. And um, people were leading uh, canoe rides and there were people for the first time getting the canoe and getting out there. You could see all the beautiful faces uh, and, and smile. People were having fun and there was a new experiences. Um, and however, we had to, um, you know, a lot of the things that we put forth in this social event, we had to bring forward our own things like a grill. We had to bring our own chairs because these things were lacking at our park and our community center, uh, center design project and community driven design project is, is to provide tables and grills and uh, to get our local park um, up to standards. And um, it's not to, something else to also mention is that uh, we gave away safety cards and um, purchased food for everybody. And we had local junkers that make it really official and fun and awarded prizes and all this while spreading the word about our project. And um, I feel so fortunate to be on this incredible stellar uh, marble uh, uh, team. I feel like we're superheroes here in the sense of who I've met and who I work with. Um, everyone is truly terrific and phenomenal and eclectic and bring an array of skills and knowledge and perspective to the table. And it is all geared towards helping Rainier Beach community and the surrounding neighborhoods. And together we've made some fantastic strides in addressing the needs of our local residents, including their desires, as Sally talked about in the design of our waterfront beach park. And everything we, everything we do is put forward in a collective effort. Um, and we won't stop, you know, we will not stop until the construction of the waterfront and the enhancements of our green and blue spaces are complete. And we look forward to the day when we can answer our own slogan, where's the beach, and probably say that it's over there. Thanks, Ashley. Oh my gosh, those pictures make me so happy. <laughs> so, so happy. Um, and if you guys want to get involved or learn more of our, of pr our projects, um, rainerbeachlinktolake.org, it's a link on the screen there. We've got so many great photos. You can see the evolution of our project. If you're a, a neighborhood project trying to get started, we'd love to see if we can share resources with you guys to, to get that advanced. Um, you can also sign up for our mailing list and keep up with our fun outreach events that we're getting ready to have very soon. And so our total um, fundraising goal is 2 million, but we've reached our phase one goal of 1 million, actually have surpassed the 1 million mark, yes. And uh, we have some pending um, pots of money, but we will likely need some help to cross the finish line. There's a significant pot uh, that will be voted on by the city council in July. And so we're waiting on word for that. Um, but yes, we still need some help and I hope you vote for equity 
in Rainier Beach with your dollars. And if not your dollars, hopefully your employee matches dollars, your neighbor's dollars, or just help spread the word about our project. And we are hosting um, an event, a socially distant, very socially distant event this Saturday at the park from 11 to 2. And we'll have a scavenger hunt, some delicious sambusas from Mama Sambusa, awesome music and good time. So hopefully if you guys want to come by, um, meet our team and see what all about. So thank you guys. Thank you, Sally and Ashley. That's a real hard act to follow. You guys are amazing. Um, I love your superheroes analogy. Absolutely, you guys are superheroes. <laughs> And, you know, just uh, what I love about this, this work is just, you know, how you all have taken, you know, the, the challenges of the situation that's in front of you and just transformed it into this active community engagement opportunity, really bringing people together around this location. So it's just amazing. And uh, um, some folks have been asking questions about, you know, how do you, how can you get more involved? Well, um, obviously going to those events and checking out what's happening. We're also really, um, we are still working on raising funds um, for Beersheba Park. So um, in the chat, you will see some links of ways you can donate to um, Beersheba Park. Um, and if you are um, in, uh, if you are interested broader in terms of some of the equity issues that was, that were shared in terms of Duwamish River Valley or um, Lake City community or other areas of the city where BIPOC communities have historically been under uh, funded and under supported um, with, uh, in our parks. We are working actively to support several park projects around the city like Beersheba. Um, and those are, you can find those on our website as well. So um, again, I just am uh, super enthusiastic um, uh, about this work. I can't wait to uh, get out to that park and um, enjoy it here soon. And um, we have time now for um, a little bit of Q&A and Maya, I'm gonna hand it over to Maya with um, some questions and please put your questions in the chat as well. Um, and uh, we'll do our best to answer those questions. Um, and um, uh, if we don't get to your question, then we are um, we commit to uh, sending out a, a communication after this to all the folks who are here tonight um, and make sure that we answer some questions, some follow ups. Um, so, Maya. Sally and Ashley, maybe I'll ask this question, frame it on two sides of the coin. And, and on the one side is um, acknowledging the inequities, the, the moment that we're in, Sally, to galvanize public resources. What does that look like? What do you need from the folks that are on this call that, you know, don't live? I don't, I live in City of Berrien. How, how do I help you advocate with our council members, with other folks? And the flip side of that, maybe Ashley, from your, from your background experience is I watch the first Copper River salmon land every year and get really excited to consume it. How does your work in this part of our city, in this watershed, impact everybody in the region? And so I think this is this sort of this, this construct of how do we help, right? And how does this really impact us, this work? Oh, um, yes, I'll kick us off. Yes, so um, even if you don't live in this area, I would definitely call up the city, the Seattle City Council members. I would call up the Parks Department and I would also share our website, just share our story, share this video as far and wide as possible. Every time we seem to do these talks and more people learn about our project, we receive donations. And these donations have added up to a considerable amount. And truly, truly anything helps. Just sharing our website would be incredible. I also want to say that it's also, you know, with my line of work, it's, it deals with like three pillars for me. It's the education, the advocacy, and the action. And I try my best, and everyone tries their best to really understand the other, everyone's relationship um, and understanding of the environment around them and how it provides to their well being and to their life. Um, so when people are, are in awe that there are salmon coming back, you know, they weren't there for a long time due to the degradation of the environment because, you know, Rainier Beach's this waterfront has been neglected. You know, and Sally has been intentional, but once that awakening happens, when you understand what you have right in front of you, you know, we have an incredible laboratory. I call it a laboratory. 
that's invisible. Um, but once that's installed and once the people are in the know, you make the invisible visible, that's why you can really understand that you can coexist with things you didn't know about. So it's really extracting that knowledge and understanding that, you know, people are at different, um, you know, stage levels of like what, you know, what sort of an environment they can provide uh, to an individual. So, so I'll say about that. Shifting, shifting a little bit for you two, you know, I think there's a couple questions that have come in. Um, what was that, what was that galvanizing moment? Maybe, maybe put, maybe personalize it for you personally to get involved with this. Like when you learned about this historic inequity, what it means to the community and why, why you stepped up with your time, your talent, your, your resources to the table. And maybe another way to ask that question as you're, as you're thinking about that is where did the where's the beach slogan come from and why is that so powerful and resonant with folks in the community and maybe and maybe broader than that kick us off uh so where's the beach the slogan um came from the 2012 neighborhood update plan for rainier beach uh the entire community participated in rewriting this plan. And one of the dreams was to have a beautiful beach in Rainier Beach. And so I actually have these old shirts that says Rainier Beach Neighborhood Update back from 2010 actually. Um, and it has the Where's the Beach slogan. And so it's, it's really incredible actually to have sat at that table um, and you know thought, thinking about this, this beach and actually sitting here at this point you know, telling everyone we've got a million dollars to build to build this beach. It's been um, really great. And I'd have to say my my personal um, galvanizing moment to get involved. Um, I, I see Maya Seguros on this call. She was the original co-chair. She moved um, out of state and um, got me linked up with this project. But it's really also important to me because this is a park that I've played in as a child. I've seen what it looked like, um, you know, 30 years ago and it actually looks worse i'm sad to say it looks worse and that's not the way it should be projects and community spaces should be improved over time but unfortunately this this was left behind ashley ashley for you your galvanizing moment <sighs> my galvanizing moment i guess i have to give it to um the other co-chair who's uh, not on the line, uh, Shannon Waits, who's a, a dear friend of mine who told me about uh, an opportunity to join a community. You know, I'm from, I, I'll be transparent here. I'm, I'm from Philadelphia. I'm from Count Creekville. I'm proud of it. However, uh, moving to Seattle, I, I definitely wanted to be part of something um, that was about, you know, really highlighting the inequities because it's, it's my job. It pulls on my heartstrings. And um, I have a lot of experience working in that sort of realm. But I also wanted to have more black environmental stewards be present. Again, it's about the visibility. You know, being a, a fisheries ecologist is, you know, there's only a few in the nation. Um, so it was very important for me to explain science in my own lexicon, my own language, and just and just be able to connect with people of color who um, were on the ground working for these, you know, these sort of uh, social justice oriented um, projects. Um, so it was just like having that sort of connection with with the lake and meeting Sally and uh, being exposed, what was going around me and getting a deep, deep dive and um, joining in on this uh, fantastic work. And we have time for sort of one more question or one more frame here, and maybe it's a forward looking one. And, and you know, uh, I'll, I'll shamelessly quote Hamilton, <laughs> like we all wanna build something that's gonna outlive us. You know, and I think Sally, you took us back to that, that thousand foot level in your, in your talk and you think about the Olmstead plan and the fact that it was about access for everyone, defining everyone quotation marks to exclude some people, but let's let's at least say that access is it was it was key to these construct. What is it that is the legacy of the pain, the frustration, the advocacy, the tireless work of people that have come before you that maybe our organizations, institutions in the city should take note of to do differently, to be better at? And like I said at the beginning of this, if we can personally consider this a success and we're not there yet because we haven't built the thing, right? What is that What is that accelerating step? What's that legacy? What's the torch you guys would want to pass to our institutions, right? You're, you talk about Sally, the landowners and the landowners are critical to this. Um, what, what would you want to pass along to make them better, faster, 
more more responsive the next the next time a bear sheva is 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 brought forward yes that's a really good question um i'll go back to something i mentioned earlier is that these ideas these opportunities for the city to demonstrate their commitment to equity these are coming if not already on the table such as our project instead of mentioning equity in your mission statements, you need to have something concrete in place for what to do when these opportunities come your way. We know that there's a finite amount of money in budgets, you know, year after year. So what are you going to do when a new project comes your way that's going to meet your equity goals? You have to have some you have to have some sort of metric to displace money from one maybe more wealthy neighborhood or more, more wealthy project and to redistribute those funds and prioritize those funds to a project or neighborhood who has been historically underserved. And so unless there is something concrete, a system in place, there's, there's not gonna be, there's not gonna be anything productive if, if these ideas just sit there. So I, I personally think there has to be, and, and I know this change is coming very quickly and that you know cities and departments are not ready for us, not ready for these conversations, um, but they have to be, they really have to be. This is something that has to get done ASAP. Thank you so much, Sally and Ashley and Maya and Jennifer. Like uh, your passion is uh, amazing. And, and the reality is, as you said, Sally, it we need more than that, um, you know, there's, real um, systemic change that we are embarking on and working on. Um, and, you know, as Jennifer pointed out, you know, sometimes the funding for projects like this, it's, it's easier to fund a project in a, in a wealthier neighborhood. And so those of you that want to advocate, um, support, you know, notify the council, um, you know, all of that is really critical in terms of ensuring that um, funding goes to those projects. And um, just like Sally's picture, um, there's actually, you know, compensatory action that needs to happen. Um, and the, the government is one of the best places where that can happen, uh, as well as um, really thinking differently about private donating, uh, donations. So um, I just encourage you guys, the Parks Foundation is embarking on an effort here to really um, elevate and, and daylight uh, some of these issues that have been um, in, you know, deeply <laughs> rooted in, uh, since the beginning of our park system. And um, there's a great opportunity to, you can yeah, go to that next slide there. Yeah, there's, here's a few of the projects that are happening out there right now that um, deserve some attention and visibility. You know, Kate and Corner has been going on for a very long time. A detective cookie at least five years you know these are parks that really need um, um, advocacy visibility and support from a community perspective um, and um, we appreciate all of your um, uh, attention and uh, commitment as al also the questions so um, we hope that you continue to join us on this journey uh, this is the first of the livable and equitable cities series um, we hope to have an additional series in uh, September focused on climate justice um, and climate justice issues within the, uh, the region and the city. So um, look forward to, to that. We will be letting you all know about that event. And um, thank you so much uh, again, Ashley, Sally, uh, Jennifer, Maya, so much uh, depth of knowledge and, and enthusiasm. And, um, and with that, I'm going to close it out. So. Thank you.